of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at Florida State University acknowledged that our university is located on the indigenous lands of the Appalachian Nation, the Muscogee Creek Nation, the Miccosukee Tribe of Florida, and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. We highlight and pay respect um, to this history because we understand how the state of Florida and Florida State University came to be settled on these lands. We recognize this land as scarred with a painful past of enslavement, settler colonial violence, the desolation of culture, and the forced removal of indigenous bodies. Despite this, we respect the cultural and ceremonial practices these indigenous nations maintain in and around Tallahassee today. As educators, we honor the knowledge of these tribes and their people and acknowledge that indigenous students, faculty, and administrators are vital to Florida State University. We embrace the decolonization of our educational system and commit to disrupting suppressive systems through the exploration of many truths and lived experiences and creating room for those who are often excluded by harmful colonial erasures in our practice and pedagogy. I think our land acknowledgement statement today is, is definitely fitting for the discussion we're going to have uh, today about positionality. And we have um, one of our higher education faculty members, Brad Cox, and three higher education doctoral students, Brittany Brewster, Sierra Fluker, and Owan Edwards today to facilitate some further discussion about positionality. So thank you all for being here and for leading us in this discussion. So I'll turn it over to you all. Uh, hi, thank you so much, Tamara, for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to have this conversation. I'm gonna try to share a screen here to make sure that you all can see. <clears throat> Y'all see that okay? All right. Um, so indeed, thank you for uh, for having us here. Uh, it's kind of fun to, to share this kind of stuff with you. And um, uh, honestly, it's a topic that I probably didn't know much about um, three years ago, uh, four years ago, five years ago. Uh, this is something that truly has uh, come to the forefront uh, only, at least in, it, it wasn't there in my graduate training. Let me put it that way. It wasn't there in my graduate training 10 years ago. So it's something that I've had to learn uh, about here uh, while at FSU as a faculty member, but I briefly want to let um, the students who are joining me today uh, to introduce themselves as well and uh, just give a little bit of context as to who we are and, and how we managed to all kind of get into this together. I can go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Brewster. I'm a third year PhD student in the higher education program and I can speak really briefly about my research interests, which focuses on the experiences which strengthen the pipelines of the professoriate for minoritized students with a specific interest in Black women doctoral students. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about my positionality, but thank you for coming. Oh, I am a candidate, Dr. Beatty. Thank you for that. It's new territory, new terrain here. Hi everyone, my name is Sierra Fluker. I'm a second year student in the higher education doctoral program. And my research interests focus on ways identity and context, context intersect with educational outcomes and experiences for black students in higher education. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Passing it on to Owan. Good afternoon, everybody. Owan Edwards here, second year PhD student in the higher education program. Uh, my research interest looks at sexually transmitted infection prevention amongst Black women on college and university campuses. Thank you all. And we'll talk a little bit more about what uh, kind of brings all four of us together. And, and there are a number of other students uh, and former students who are involved in the project that really brought positionality to the forefront uh, for all of us. And uh, uh, thank you all for sharing the research interest because that plays into the, our positionality, uh, particularly as it relates to the type of research we do. And that's true for me as well. So <clears throat> I study uh, autistic college students in part because right up above me right now is my autistic son. Um, so I have a, a very direct relationship with uh, the topics that I research as well. And we'll get into how that plays out uh, a little bit down the line here. So uh, real briefly, uh, I wanted to show you a, a couple of things about what we are uh, planning to do today. 
Uh, the first is just to give you a little bit of a definition. As I said, this was a, a term that was new to me as a faculty member. So I wanna make sure we have some degree of clarity on what positionality is. Wanna highlight the application in multiple places, uh, challenging some of the assumptions about where positionality is or is not relevant. Uh, third, wanna uh, offer some examples from each of us. Uh, some of these will have some overlap uh, because one of the projects that the four of us were working on recently was uh, something that we were all doing together, but we each have our own uh, stories and experiences with positionality in other cases as well. Fourth, we wanna make sure that we're not just talking at you, uh, but by the way, you are feel free along the way to ask questions if there are things that come up and you would like us to clarify to engage uh, in a conversation about something specific along the way, feel free to do so. But, <clears throat> Uh, and point number four, we'll ask you to kind of get involved in that uh, personal reflection on your positionality, but then also to engage in a, in a larger discussion with all of us. And then finally, at the end, uh, I will uh, share kind of an example of how uh, positionality or an understanding of or a representation of the positionality has evolved. Uh, and I'll, I'll share my personal example of language that I have used uh, over time to try to address positionality. And, and I'm hopeful, gosh, I hope you all agree at the end of this, that the most recent version is better than the one that I started with um, several years ago. So <clears throat> if it's not, don't be afraid to tell me, but I think I'll have to do some things differently then. Okay, um, at this point, I guess, uh, if I could, I'd love to have, um, I think Brittany, both of these were from you, both of these definitions. So, um, if you wouldn't mind, could you talk us through where you got these definitions from and, and help us kind of understand the, the key components of uh, positionality? By the way, we haven't gone over all this ahead of time, so I just kind of threw Brittany out there and be like, hey, go ahead. Sorry. So you weren't prepped for that one. My bad. Sure thing. I'm I'm going to do my best, Brad, or Dr. Cox. So the very first um, citation, I believe, came from, I want to say, um, a recent SAGE publication. Um, I, I, I don't remember the exact specific text, but um, I think positionality, what, what I really pull from this definition is that it is a stance or a positioning in relation to a specific context. So in relation to a social and a political context, and I think that that's really important when we're thinking about our research and how we approach the research process because that's ever evolving and changing. And so um, that stance shifts based on what it is that we are, are seeking to make meaning out of and um, seeking to understand. And so the second definition I really uh, valued and thought was meaningful because it brings into focus how that specific stance or position is influenced by those personal values, views that are informed by broader social identities that might include our gender, race, class, and other salient aspects of who we are in relation to that broader context again. And so again, highlighting that, that these positions change and shift based on the research context and that the knowledge that we are seeking to make meaning of and make meaning about um, is, is inherently filtered through that, that those different locations and the different ways that we approach our, our position to the research that we're investigating. So one of the things that caught me in that definition <clears throat> and is one of the things that you will see as you, you see the evolution of my language about my own positionality is, is that it is a, um, a fluid or a dynamic thing. It is not simply a statement of, oh, I am this. It's not simply an identity statement, but rather how that identity and, and uh, position is relative to the context uh, of the current time, the current space the people you're working with, the study you're doing, that kind of thing. So that uh, I really appreciate that definition because it reminds me of the dynamic quality that I uh, had originally ignored. Okay, questions uh, about the definitions or either of those, uh, and it, are there other more casual definitions uh, that people tend to keep in mind when they are uh, thinking about what their positionality might be? Well, then I expect you all to have this memorized um, <clears throat> by the time we get to the end of this, uh, this little slideshow. Okay, um, so uh, the next thing I want to highlight here is the idea of this, um, the, the notion of positionality is applicable everywhere. Um, and I guess 
uh, Awan, Sierra, or Brittany, uh, please tell me, raise a hand, yell at me if, if you want to jump in on some of this. Otherwise, I'll just kind of read off the notes that we had um, previously. Either of you want to jump in? You want to take one of them? Oh, come on. There's nobody jumping. All right. So, um, so I guess it, most of us, at least I did, and I think it's really, really easy to see how the idea of positionality can play out in a qualitative study or in a qualitative uh, setting, right? It's really easy to see how uh, one's relationship to the interviewees or to focus group participants could influence the way in which the data is collected, right? Uh, and it's also pretty straightforward to recognize that, you know, where we sit uh, socially in relationship to the topic under study or to the participants in the study, yeah, it'll affect the, the kind of inductive uh, sense-making process that occurs through qualitative research. Uh, and that will show up in, in data analyses, in the, um, uh, sorry, in the data collection, in the analyses, and in the interpretation of those qualitative data, right? So it's really easy to initially recognize uh, positionality in qualitative research. But what I have heard a couple of my more quantitatively inclined uh, colleagues and occasionally students say is that, yeah, but that doesn't really apply to quant stuff, right? We're asking a question, it gets a data point, that data point is there, there's no <clears throat> inductive in, um, interpretation of those data, it's just data, right? And I really wanna push back on that um, in, in part because I feel like I probably was that guy 10 years ago. I probably would have made a comment like that. Um, but there are, are so many different ways when one's position relative to the work shows up and you know, think about the way in which uh, we phrase questions on a survey. Okay? You got to write questions to a survey. Um, yeah, you get back a number one to four, sure. But somebody had to write that question. And if you're the one writing that question, think of the difference in the way in which uh, a student might respond or respondent might answer the question. Uh, I, I do work on, on uh, autism, which disability kind of plays into sometimes. And so I've played around with some survey questions. Think if you would get a different answer if you were to ask the question, one, are you a student with a disability? Okay, think of what your answer might be. Second alternative, are you disabled? Fundamentally trying to get at the same underlying information, but phrased differently might very well get a different question or may very well get a different uh, answer. And then let's take a third effort. Do you, <coughs> survey respondent, have any mental or physical conditions that prevent you from performing significant life functions? I gotta tell you, those actually represent three very different ways of thinking about disability. The last one is the government's definition. Like that's how they define in a legal sense, whether one has a disability. Uh, and then the difference between a student with a disability versus being disabled is a, a kind of um, a, a paradigm war of sorts in the field. Uh, to, and where you fit in that paradigm is, uh, is going to determine what questions you ask the way you ask them, and, and those will shape what data you get back. Uh, positionality also shows up in terms of what variables you choose to, clue, to use in an analysis. Do you control for race, gender, age? Uh, do you uh, couple race and ethnicity as one variable? Does, uh, and when it comes to disability, does it matter if it's any disability or do you categorize by physical disability versus uh, mental or emotional uh, cognitive disability? Do you put all those things uh, in the model? Do you, those kinds of, do you do interaction terms? Do you care uh, or know or suspect that there are going to be interactions between race and disability? You know, those kinds of things, again, are related to how we know uh, our topic. And then it even shows up in, in how we interpret our findings quantitatively, right? If you have four different regression equations and you get a pattern of findings out of those things, you still have to interpret. What does it actually mean? What does that tell you about the underlying phenomena? Um, and so uh, we actually have that type of uh, effect on our own quantitative research through positionality uh, just as much as we do in, in qualitative. But frankly, I'll say it shows up in every type of research. It doesn't matter if it's quant, qual, mixed, or some variant thereof. Uh, who we are shapes the questions we ask, why I ask certain questions, why you ask certain questions. It shapes what theories or models or frameworks we use to, to kind of guide our data collection or analysis, what type of data we collect, how we interpret those findings. Um, <clears throat> and I think, um, I want I'll, I'll call you in on this one. Um, do you see the, the quote? I'm pretty sure it was from you. Um, the Shaw quote? 
the Shaw quote. Okay, so are you referring to the one of, um, as the, I submitted a quote saying, uh, when you're doing qualitative research, there's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do it. The main thing is to keep in mind your participants and how you identify with that particular method um, that you are choosing to use for the particular study that you're doing. Is that the one, Brad? I think it's coming out of the same uh, article. Uh, the thing, thing that I had written down was the, the positionality and researcher status as an insider or outsider, which is where I think you're talking about the connection to the, the participants has implications. Um, so I just basically, I want to say it's not just us saying this, right? Um, so a, a, an article from Shaw um, that the that insider outsider status has implications for the topics we choose to study, the way we do the research, the way we engage with our participants, how we analyze our data, data and how we communicate our findings. Uh, and I think that is pretty common, uh, a pretty thorough definition of how this influences all of research. But I don't want us to think that it's just a research thing. It is a research and teaching and learning and a daily life thing too, but at least as it relates to our work, it shows up in teaching and learning as well. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll let the students speak to the to how it shows up for you all. And I, and I think it does uh, in, in a lot of ways as a, as a student as well. But from a faculty perspective, it shows up in terms of what readings that I assign, what topics to address, which in my theory classes, which theorists do we build up, which theorists do we knock down, which um, uh, theories do we spend two weeks on rather than one week on. Those kind of things are all related to how I approach the work or what matters to me, which you know is, is dependent a little bit on where I am in relationship to those topics. It also uh, shapes what activities are assigned or the assessments that we use. And um, you know, it even shows up in the grading of our papers and our projects, right? What matters to us? Uh, you know, am I more concerned about the creativity of the argument, the clarity of that argument, the evidence behind that argument? Am I more persuaded by some type of evidence than I am by other types of evidence? And all of those things affect the grading. And all of those things are in part because of the way in which I was socialized, my position towards um, education and towards what a doctoral program should be. Um, and, and I guess uh, I'm curious, students, could you talk a little bit about when you get an assignment, how does your positionality play out, maybe not even an assignment, but in a classroom, how does your positionality affect the way in which you engage uh, the class itself? Brad, would now be a good time for me to talk about what I thought when you had us do the rethinking theory project? Yeah, so I'm very of a transition there. I think it's a, a decent place to transition sort of next. Yeah, that's where we're going next. Okay, perfect. So because that's what the first thing that popped into my head. So um, we had a project for Brad's class. Um, so my project was to rethink the cross model, uh, which is in my, well, it's obsolete. And so Brad said, well, you need to rethink it. And you know, um, how do you, how does this apply and just rethink it? So I'm like, how do I rethink it? Why is Brett having me to do this in this way? Well, after doing the project and then thinking about to how I have developed to where I am now and am still developing. So I'm gonna share a story and then give you like an analogy. So most recently, like last week I was, um, I'm also taking a health behavioral education class. And when I was reading a particular um, chapter in this book, it mentioned how um, theories, I'm learning a bunch of health theories. They said, you know, theories are actually um, different pieces of a puzzle. And then once you, you know, put the puzzle together, it makes, you know, this great marvelous picture. So I thought about it in a different way, you know, as a child growing up, so, you know, my mother would get me a puzzle, let's say Mickey Mouse. And so I'm trying to figure out how to put the puzzle together, right? Until they fit and move, get a little more advanced. You buy those puzzles that are, that are like the Taj Mahal, right? Well, as you're putting the puzzle together, it, the pieces are supposed to fit. So when I'm looking at the cross model, I'm thinking from my own identity and positionality, especially back to Brad's, you know, uh, the project I had to do for his class. I'm looking at the cross model, my positionality. Okay, so I'm black, this actually fits, but there's nowhere here that talks about somebody who is black and a part of the LGBT community. I identify as black and gay. So this, now the pieces are not working. Where are the pieces? Did I throw them in the trash? Are they under the carpet? No, it's not working. And then it clicked you have to create the pieces that are missing. And so that's when 
I had to, you know, go to the different uh, other theories to help create what I thought the cross model should look like. Um, and well, at the time it was 2019. So now we're just say 2021. So borrowing from, I borrowed from the RMMDI model. If you don't know what that is, that is the reconceptualized model of multiple dimensions of identity. I borrowed two of Chickering's models. I borrowed um, Erickson's stages of um, psychosocial development. And I borrowed a, uh, a thing or two from Baxter Magoda's self-authorship because I'm like, this is how I view, you know, myself and black students today. And also the various students that I have supervised and taught in the past, you know, at uh, uh, Michigan State University of Maryland. So I was thinking of all of things, all of those things, which is why when I came back to Brad and said, okay, I have my theory. And I said, you know, black students are multifaceted and this is why. So just to give you a, you know, from my point of view, I took my positionality. There were other things too to talk about as well. Um, race, social class, sexual orientation, religion, that's a big part of it. Cross doesn't talk about any of those things. And all of those things you have to talk about concerning black students or you're doing the students a disservice. So that's my take on it. Thank you, Juan. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll um, go back and, and mention that the, the project that Awan's talking about, can you all hear me? Okay, the project that Awan's talking about, um, it was in our um, student development theory course with Brad and the assignment that we had um, was to um, look at the theories that we had learned about in the course and um, choose a theory to rethink, um, whether it was to build on it, to change it. Um, and the idea was that um, a lot of these theories were developed, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and things have changed since then. The demographics of students in colleges and universities have changed. And so we, uh, I think myself, um, Owan, and, and I think Brittany too, we looked at um, black student development theories. Um, and so for me, um, and I think this kind of goes back to Brad's original question, how my positionality comes to play when I'm approaching my assignments, I'm always just interested in, and just based off my own positionality, the black experience, because it's oftentimes in my education is left out of the curriculum. Um, and so I was excited for this opportunity to research that and, and see how black students are, you know, how they develop, even just in our theory book um, that we have, our student development theory book, there's only a handful of of theories that were introduced that talked about black student development, um, which is a testament to the fact that, you know, in my experience that that voice is often left out, it's excluded. Um, and so for my project, I looked, I was really interested, um, and in case it comes from my experience of being a black student on um, predominantly white campuses um, for undergrad, for my master's, and now for my, my, doctor, my doctorate degree. Um, and experiencing microaggressions, uh, experiencing racism and discrimination in my own life, um, that I'm also interested in that in my own research. And so I rethought Cross's model and brought in um, the racial biophotite um, framework and rethought the theory in that way. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it relates to me. And then, I mean, just a little bit of, even more, more than that, I'm biracial. So my mom is Hispanic and my dad is black. And so the way that I think about race and ethnicity and conceptualize it um, is, is really unique to my own experience um, being um, a black Latina. Um, and so that's kind of just a little bit about how I approach my assignments. Okay, um, I, I can also share my approach to the rethinking project in Sierra, thank you again for framing what it is that we're talking about. So um, I, I position myself as a black cisgender heterosexual African-American woman, US born citizen, um, second generation college student, raised middle class for most of my life. And so I share that because I, I know that it heavily informs the way that I approached my rethinking experience. 
Um, I was born and raised and worked for most of my lived experience in Miami, which is very much so on its way to becoming a multicultural global city. Um, and it really highlighted how Black racial identities are constantly negotiated. They are recognized and embodied, especially based on individuals' ethnicities, among other social identities like gender, class, immigrant status, et cetera. And so from my own personal lived experiences, especially thinking about um, being an undergraduate student, I had to constantly articulate the relevance and influence of my racial identity to my peers, like many who were Black, uh, like me and shared that racial um, identity, but yet had maybe a different ethnic identity, uh, struggled to understand how I could have so much salience and so much pride in, in um, being Black. And so confronting, constantly having to confront the influence of my racial identity, um, or my constantly having to confront my racialized and gendered identity in this manner, thinking specifically about undergrad, really became a central part of my own journey of amplifying my voice. And so when it came time to rethink a theory, I naturally went back to that college experience of having to constantly art articulate what it meant to be Black, why that was super salient to me. And for my rethinking project, I decided to focus on how Black college students cultivate a sense of self-authorship, reimagining the very popular Baxter Magolda theory. And self-authorship is described as the ability to internally cultivate a belief system, I guess you can describe it, that guides how we as individuals interact with the broader world and broader context. And so when I think about my experiences, especially thinking back into a community that had a great deal of ethnic pride and where individuals' experiences were heavily shaped by class, citizen status, and many other things. Those experiences heavily shaped my interest in how I approached the reconstruction of self-authorship theory. Um, one thing about self-authorship I'll share very quickly is that it fails to incorporate how systems of oppression shape how we come and how we may come to recognize, understand, and utilize that internal voice that is self-authorship. So the theory doesn't give any space to acknowledge that we exist in racialized, gendered, classed, all kinds of um, ways that are shaped by these systems of oppression. And as a result, the questions that the theory poses that people have to confront in order to move through the self-authorship process had to be problematized from my perspective, from what I knew about other people's experiences in Miami and in other places and rethought to acknowledge that these systems, hey, like these systems exist and they're not just racialized and gendered and they influence how we know who we are and how we construct these relationships. And so in thinking as a result of my experiences, my positionality, um, and having a very salient racial identity, I knew when I was creating and rethinking this theory that I needed to create something that wasn't just for me. Um, I needed to create something for the people who also identified as Black but maybe didn't have the same salient racial identity to be able to see themselves go through the process of self-authorship in this rethinking project. And I also wanted to create something that allowed for folks who also were Black but like Owan said, existed in dynamic and um, multifaceted ways uh, to be able to also confront other systems of oppression in that self-authorship process. Because for me, self-authorship um, requires for you to confront and acknowledge that these systems exist before you can move through that process. And so just wanted to share a little bit about my own experience and how that, that really informed how I approached that topic. And want to say that that was that very specific topic. And I think the process, I don't think, I know the process looks very different in thinking about my own dissertation research or other experiences that we have and topics that we explore within the re research team. So again, those social locations shift based on what it is that we're focusing on. So uh, thank you all for sharing that. And uh, I'll talk briefly about the flip side of that assignment. So um, uh, Awan, Brittany, and Sierra mentioned uh, the way in which their positions uh, and their social identities shaped what they chose to, to focus on and, and how they approached that work. Uh, but there was a different kind of positionality in a classroom as well, because uh, again, uh, position is not just identity, but it's a relationship in a particular context. And in the context of a classroom, I was the instructor, they were the students, that 
I had a very real uh, authority or power over things that mattered. I, I controlled their grades, right? And so, uh, you know, one of the things that I have struggled with, uh, and I'm, I'm a uh, straight white male uh, who's getting older than I would like to be, um, but you know, I, I'm a, a wildly privileged guy in, in a very powerful position in that classroom or with that assignment. And so one of the really hard things for me was to think, how is it that I could go about um, acknowledging that power differential, but doing so in a way that would uh, create the space for students who wanted to write on things that were outside of my wheelhouse, or that might even challenge many of the, the systems that have served me incredibly well. You know, how is it that I can make that uh, a feasible, uh, uh, I don't know if a safe approach is quite the right word, but an approach that would be, um, uh, that students would be willing to do. And, you know, so part of that was me trying to give um, the, the kind of freedom uh, to, to make their own choices, to choose their own, um, their own topics. But, you know, that meant that I would have to be really open to and, you um, non-judgmental, I don't know if that's the right word, non-discriminatory in how I reacted to things. And as much as I might really, really wish to, like, was I really, was I really as open as I wish I were uh, to every argument, to every topic? Um, and, and, you know, I'd, I'd like to say sure, but I'm also quite confident that I privilege certain types of evidence over others, uh, that I um, privilege certain kinds of um, writing or styles uh, over others that, you know, even in the effort to try to be, um, uh, to minimize the, the effects of that power differential, I'm certain that students end up having to um, think through what is it that Brad really wants? Is he going to be reading this as the old white guy standing at the front of the class? How is he going to read this? And that is in part because of our very different positionalities. Um, uh, and that all comes around to what you see up on the screen now at the, the top right. Um, so, uh, the three students here didn't all take my class at the same time. Uh, there were, uh, semesters or years apart. And what I kept seeing is that through this assignment, every single year, there were at least two and usually three or four students who wrote about black identity development models or, uh, infusing other models with a more, um, uh, black informed kind of like that was the rethinking they would rethink uh, a white theory or uh, a kind of old theory that didn't consider race at one point and infuse it with uh, issues related to race and so when this happened every year uh, I, I realized man there you know these students and there were eight or nine of you all uh, in the initial invitation I think um, that there are some overlap, there's a lot of complementary work, but the fact that this is showing up every single year is a topic needing to be addressed, and they're doing it really well, there needs to be something here beyond just a handful of really good class papers, uh, that there was a, a story to be told, and that there were insights to be shared in the collective of these students. So, uh, and this is where the, the kind of positionality shifts outside the classroom. And, and this is where I'll be fully transparent is that this was the most challenging, like I, I felt the most um, anxiety about my role and my positionality in the, the kind of activity that we're gonna tell you about here. But effectively I wrote to the eight or nine students who had written on black identity development theories and said, hey, look, Y'all have written on similar topics. I think there's some value to putting you all in the same room and seeing what comes out of it. And maybe there's a paper, maybe there's a, a publication, maybe there's a presentation, maybe there's a webinar. I didn't know what it was gonna be, but just truly thought there was quality there and need there. So I wanted to bring these folks uh, together. But I gotta tell you, it, it was incredibly awkward for me because here I am, the old white guy saying, you all students, who are Black, talking about Black identity theory, uh, you all should come together. Um, and then getting out of the way, it's, it's a, it was a really strange spot for me because in that space, when we literally got everybody together, I think we were still in person at one point um, <laughs> before Zoom happened, um, that literally sitting around the room was the one white guy and the eight or nine students who were Black. And where in the classroom, I had that formal grading authority to assign, you know, to grade assignments, to set up the, the specifics of a requirement uh, for a class. In that space, 
I had dropped, like my positional power in a formal sense had been dropped significantly. I no longer controlled any of these students' grades, but uh, there was still an awful lot of uh, kind of implicit or underlying power uh, differential there and that, you know, I would be writing some of these students' letters of recommendations. Um, so there are things that I can be doing to affect their career down the line. Um, there were some inconsistencies or contrast between what we viewed as expertise. So, you know, I'm a faculty member, so I felt like I had expertise in theory in a broad way uh, and some expertise about the academy, what it, you know, what happens uh, in publication and presentations. But I had really little idea on how to frame this process to uh, key stakeholders, particularly Black scholars are scholars who are writing on the development of black student identity. I don't know, uh, I don't have the personal connection to be able to know how to properly frame that, particularly for my own position as, uh, as a white guy. Uh, and then I know um, students, sometimes you all had um, uh, kind of different levels of expertise because you all knew your theory really, really well. And you also had experiential insights uh, as you mentioned, many of the topics were coming out of your own personal experiences and, and insights from there. But then you were also, uh, it felt like at times, at least some students were very quick to fall back into that kind of hierarchical, you know, he's a professor, uh, the, we had some recent PhD graduates in there, and then, oh, I'm a, uh, I'm a first year or second year doc student, and that that hierarchy came back out again. Um, so I, I guess it, it yeah, I, I don't know exactly how I want to frame the, the next few minutes of discussion, but I, I'd like to uh, ask the students if, if you could speak a little bit about how that positionality may have played out for you all and some of the tensions that were kind of inherent in that structure when you had multiple people of multiple identities uh, in, in that somewhat less formal uh, relationship. Okay, I can start. Um... It's so funny because I can remember our first meeting um, for the Theory So White presentation. We actually ended up taking it to Ash. So that was a huge accomplishment. We were really excited. But from the very beginning, this was before the pandemic and COVID. So we met um, in a room across the hall from our suite. And there was like Brad and I and Jesse and like who else, folks who couldn't make it, we did have them like on Zoom and we had on a large projector. And so we basically just went around the room and brainstormed, you know, you know, the different expertise. And, um, you know, we have folks who are, you know, writing dissertations. So we were like, by all means, you know, I'm just like, a, a, what was our first year, I guess, at the time? I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. So for me, it was just taking it all in and learning from everybody around the table, because I felt like, I do know certain things that they may not know because of my experience, but there are still going to be things that um, are identical or similar or same shared experiences. Um, so I just took more so um, like a sponge, a student in the classroom, and then where there is opportunity for me to, you know, give my thoughts or my insight, you know, I went ahead and I did that. Um, I felt very comfortable. Um, with everyone, you know, around the table. And I thought that, I thought it was interesting to observe and watch Brad, our professor, because like he said, he was not over us as far as, you know, like grades are concerned, but he was, in my opinion, giving us a platform to take this a step further. So that would be my position on the as how I viewed him during the process from all of the meetings, all the brainstorming, all of the early Friday morning meetings as we were, you know, um, coming up with how we were going to finalize the project with all of the um, individual um, uh, meeting of the minds, you know, if you will, coming together to what we what ended up being something great. So that was my position. I was basically a student in a sponge, just taking it in and looking and writing it down. And then there was a question they say, well, what do you think about this? And I just thought I'll say it. Anything black, I'm for it. I tried to write on everything in my, <laughs> in my project with Brad anyway. And Brad, I said, I, I said towards the end, I even had nerve enough to write about racial battle fatigue. And I know Brad was like, okay, it fits, but like, really, you're, we got to calm you down because you're trying to talk about, you know, everything possible. So that's, that's kind of where I was with it. 
Uh, go ahead, Brittany. Oh, <laughs> I, I would definitely say, I think that there was um, some deference as the, I, if you think about it, we, I, I envisioned us kind of like a community of scholars, but we felt like family and I felt like the middle child because I'm a third year doc student and we had at the time, um, we had, I had, there were doc students, Sierra and Awana and the cohort um, right behind me. And then we had recent graduates. And so there was definitely a lot of deference to the experiences that doc students who recently graduated and who have presented at ASH and submitted proposals to deferring to them and to uh, Dr. Cox or Brad um, throughout the process for how to um, how to pursue or um, navigate the formalities of the process. But I would say my positionality, especially knowing that what we were producing was about black student development theory really situated me. And I think tried to make sure that other people felt like they were experts, that this was our process, right? Like uh, Brad is here to support us and to help clarify how to do certain things or to um, provide insight to some of those hidden curriculum pieces of like what it, it looks like to maybe present at ASH, but we are the experts. This is our scholarship. How do we um, create an experience that is gonna be reflective of what it is that we've created? And so um, even though Brad was present um, as, a, as a faculty member, I think more so the, the, the politics or the positionality of my role as a middle child, so to speak, showed up a lot within the planning process, but as, um, as a scholar felt very, very comfortable being able to articulate um, how I felt like we should shape and, um, and create this experience for, for folks who would attend the session. Um, I think um, one thing that I, I remember experiencing is, um, uh, questioning whether, you know, those people who were coming to ASH to hear us speak, um, if this would be something that, our topic, if this would be something that they would buy into. Because um, in, in our proposal and in our presentation, we kind of talked about how, or the ways that um, there's structural racism in the academy. Um, we also talked about how um, what's published, um, like, uh, you know, publication by black black authors writing about black student development. We question whether or not it's, um, you know, held or what do I want to say it's um, respected as as much in the academy. And so I was really nervous about as a first year doc student about making those arguments to a room of full of other scholars. Um, and I remember feeling like. Um, do I, do I want to take that stance? Um, even though as a black woman, um, I know that these conversations are important to have um, and, and as a research that I'm interested in, I felt that anxiety of coming out and talking about it. Um, and then even just, I felt like I also didn't, I don't know if I felt comfortable speaking for all black students and, and their experiences because the black student experience is so multifaceted and um, depending on where you are in the country and your ethnicity and um, just other other identities, I wanted to make sure that you know we were doing it justice. And I think that kind of comes back to feeling like just even in the classroom, um, being that person who has to speak on the black experience and, and having that um, that stress or that um, that pressure to to, to deliver. I remember feeling those kind of things too. So I guess that's just my positionality showing up in the in the process too. Indeed, uh, and it showed up in the the presentation at the end as well because <clears throat> uh, it, it was really wonderful. Uh, and I'm going to try to do here what I say I'm going to do in a lot of meetings and what I said I was going to do in a lot of our meetings with the uh, this group, uh, but to shut up and get out of the way. And uh, so at this point, I guess in this presentation, I want to shut up and get out of the way because I told them a lot of times like, oh, I've got a thought, I got a thought, I got a thought. Wait, no, nope, I'm going to shut up and get out of your way. Uh, and, and that was a difficult lesson for, for me to learn. But I want to try to practice a little bit of that lesson right now with um, a, a little bit of time for you all to do a little bit about uh, your own positionality. So I guess uh, before we go too far into that, are there questions that you have for us that you would like us to try to address before uh, kind of doing a little bit of the, the self-reflection and, and recognition of one's uh, own positionality. Okay. 
this has been quiet. Okay. Um, it is, it is, it's like in the classroom, right? When, when you ask a question and nobody says anything. All right. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do then is just to take, we got about 15 minutes left here. Um, what I'd like to, to ask is, um, to take a moment and just on a little piece of paper, scrap notebook, a uh, piece of paper and a little desktop uh, text box or something, uh, to first start with the broad identities that you hold. Uh, so we've talked about identity in a number of different ways, and it's you know focused primarily on race and gender in, in this particular context. But I'd like you to go ahead and just literally take one minute, write down all of the identities that you can think of that you ascribe to or that you would identify uh, with yourself. If you want to go ahead and take like another five or 10 more seconds to, to write, that'd be great. And at this point, I guess I, I do, I want to make sure that I, I can invite as many of you all to join us uh, in, in an interactive way as, as possible. But, uh, you know, when, when a lot of people write those things down the first time, the, uh, the kind of obvious ones, race and gender tend to show up. But there are a lot of other identities that are perhaps less obvious or less um, uh, commonly referenced uh, when we talk about identities or positionality. So I'd like to invite, uh, would anyone in the audience be willing to share a different identity beyond race or gender uh, that uh, affects perhaps how you view research or teaching? Um, I'm a mother and I'm low income and I feel like those two things really impact um, the decisions I make as a researcher and the um, number of risks I can take or the number of opportunities I have to share my work um, just because I have to really choose very carefully. Thank you. Yeah. Others? I wrote down that I identify as a millennial, and I think in my research interests and the topic that I want to discuss, which is social media, um, it absolutely matters um, that I was around when a lot of the platforms um, started and have the ability to have seen a lot of them um, evolve versus a lot of my, what might be my participants um, will have had these tools since they were born. age or generational status yeah thank you the cox i wrote down um single parent product of domestic violence and first generation college student um and i think in terms of that research lens looking at things that impact particularly with black males um and the lens by which they perceive um their surroundings and their environment and how that uh sometimes has lasting implications of uh decisions and actions that they take moving forward and then in terms of positionality, how to bring that lens and that perspective to the research lens um, and what that means for uh, what we're producing and the scholarly work that we bring to the table. Um, Brad, I didn't want to leave our people out in the chat. We have Melba put international student. We also have Pei who wrote international student plus one. Um. For me, uh, it was important to think of myself in terms of being a daughter or sister. So um, familial position, because it was it's actually one of the first things that when you mentioned the word positionality, I think of my position just within my family. And I just realized through this conversation how much that does impact my, my interests, my research interests, particularly for Latino males, because I have two brothers. So um, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, and and what several of you, uh, not oh, sorry, a, a non traditional first gen uh, indigenous student, I, we're we're finding all uh, all kinds of different things that perhaps might not come to the forefront of a an external reader, someone who doesn't know you. Uh, uh, and just reading your paper somewhere down the line. Uh, but I, I'm also, uh, it was interesting to me how quickly we transitioned. When I put together this slide, you'll see that, you know, point B A, B dot A is about broad identities that you hold. And then the second being professional statuses, relationships, and historical experiences. And what you all just reminded me is that those are not separate things, uh, that our, our sense of identities uh, and the identities we hold are contributing to our professional status or our uh, driving or a result of our relationships with other people. And then those very things shape our experiences and those experiences shape our identity. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, indeed, those things all do uh, interact. And I, I guess at, at this point, what I'd like to try to do is to move beyond the identification of the things that might be affecting us uh, that might be shaping the way we think, because it's it, it, at least it was for me, it was a whole lot easier for me to be like, yeah, uh, I'm a straight white male father of two. That is surely affecting the way in which I am viewing my work and the type of work I want to do. Absolutely. But it was really much more difficult to articulate how it was affecting it. And so I, I'd like at this point to see if um, you all would, again, take just a couple moments here. And I, and I first want you to start with uh, a recent project, whether it's a dissertation project, a study you're doing now, uh, or even the way in which you were engaging with a, a peer in a classroom, approaching an assignment, uh, working with a doctoral student, whatever it is, but a spot where in the realm of teaching, learning, or research, you had an opportunity to make decisions where you were not subject to somebody else's whims, them telling you what to do, but when you got to make choices about how to approach a project, uh, the topic you would choose, the method you would choose, the analysis you run, whatever it is. Go ahead and identify that in your own mind. And once you've got that particular project in mind, I'd like you to think back to the list that you just wrote about your various identities. And I'd like you to first, you know, just check off two or three of those identities or those relationships or statuses that you think likely influenced the way in which you approached that project or some part of that project. So let's make the connection now between the identity you hold and the project um, that you are undertaking with those identities. And I'm assuming that's a relatively straightforward piece of this project, uh, this, this kind of activity here. But here's the part that has been incredibly hard for me to learn. And when I read as a reviewer of other people's work, where I find people have the most difficulty making this last step, which is to articulate how that identity or that particular positionality actually affects the work that is being done or the choices that are being made uh, or the decisions that you are um, choosing between. Um, so not just what identities affect the project. But my challenge to you now is, can you pick one of those identities for that project and speculate how that identity or how that position shaped what you did in that project? And at the end of this next slide or two are a couple of examples from my own work, but I wanna um, save space before that to hear from you all. If you could give us you know, an example of a project you've been working on, uh, an identity or a position, uh, social or political or personal position that you've held and how those things, how those positions affected your choices on that project. Uh, feel free to jump in as you're able. I mean, I'm, uh, I mentioned that I'm a mother and in low income and I will say that as I consider my dissertation, I have to think of two things in particular that maybe wouldn't be as relevant otherwise. One is that I need my dissertation to be a pathway to employment for me. I don't, I, I have to keep in mind what skills I'm demonstrating and how that will make me employable because I don't have a lot of time to play with and I don't have a lot of resources to play with. So I've started to lean more towards the quantitative perspective, even though I really believe deeply in qualitative research only because I feel like uh, in order to be hired, I have to demonstrate my like ability to think and reason 
um, in a quantitative way, even though I, I, I consider myself a mixed methods researcher. Thank you for sharing. Uh, others, uh, another example, perhaps? Uh, it, for, for me, it, it shapes um, the ways that I collect data um, in how I conduct focus groups or interviews um, as a, a as a Black woman who is researching other Black women, um, it, it has made things easier, but it also complicates things because, but as um, Sierra mentioned, I think it was Sierra uh, mentioned, all Black folks aren't the same. And so there are some, um, there's some entry that I have because I share identity with them, but at the same time, some ways that I have to make sure that I'm not projecting my experience onto all Black women. And so how I go about establishing rapport and trust in when I'm engaging with participants um, is more relational and I take time to do that than I think um, others of, of my, my colleagues, even when we go out and we've been out in the field. I may take more time to do that and establish kind of who I am and where I come from and why I'm here. Even in, you know, we're having a, 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 a focus group with community college leaders. Why is that important to them? It might not be important to them, but it is how I enter a space and that's how I develop rapport. Does that make sense? Indeed, thank you. Uh, can I perhaps one more story before we move on to the last little bit? One more example from you all. I can jump in if no one. I think my identity as a observant Jew has really, and especially as I keep growing in that, has really shaped or starting to shape in good ways, I think, my teaching and my advising in terms of I think it, with advising in particular, I think it, and in teaching when it's working with individual students who may have something going on in their lives, may be struggling with something of, of being, of looking at and interacting with the student in a more holistic perspective, that it's not just about class assignments, it's not just about making a step in progress in your studies, but it's about the human condition in the graduate school experience and, and that the human condition, there's so many things, there's the physical, there's the mental, and then there's the spiritual. And I think that I am starting to do that. And I think I'd like to continue to do that and infuse that kind of understanding that learning throughout my teaching, but also, and I haven't done this yet in terms of more research orientation that one's a little bit harder for me, but we'll find a way somehow. Thank you. Uh, and I, I really appreciate that that shows up. Uh, we have several different positions, identities there that were referenced uh, across those three examples and affecting very different parts of the teaching and learning process from research uh, decisions to um, employment paths to uh, you know, advising relationships. So uh, I guess I want to end with a, a quick little thing to note that um, we, I hope by the, at the beginning of this uh, presentation, you got the, you know, to know that it was there, that positionality was a thing. It was a thing that was relevant regardless of who you are or the type of work you were doing, whether it's quantitative, qualitative research or in class. Uh, with the last activity was designed to kind of help recognize when and how positionality matters and is uh, is affecting the work that you're doing. If it always matters, and the, the thing that you all just went through is kind of a how it affects the work you do. The last little bit I want to touch on very briefly, and I know I'm at the end of my time, so if you all need to run, I, I take no offense whatsoever. But if you got three minutes, um, the last part of this is trying to present that or represent 
that positionality in a outward facing way. So when you're uh, doing research, yes, you can recognize that it has all kinds of effects on the decisions you're making, but your readers, the people who are going to be interpreting your interpretation of your data are gonna to need to know where it is that your positionality affects the work that you did so that they can then have a better understanding of how their positionality may affect the way in which they are interpreting your work or making use of your work. And I gotta tell you, that is a really, really hard thing. That was a really hard thing for me to do. And this is what I'll, uh, I'll show you my example here uh, that I truly consider baby steps. So that, that very first time, uh, it was my identity is a neurotypical white male influence this study. I did the idiot's guide version, right? I picked the most prominent identities, white and male, and then the one that was most relevant to my research, which is uh, about autism, so neurotypical. I took those three very obvious things and I simply said, they affected the work I did. Well, no shit. Um, I didn't tell them how, I didn't know why, and that was actually reflective of just how little I understood of my own positionality. So the next study I did, I wrote something that was like, my interest in the topic and my interpretation of the interview transcripts were likely shaped, I still couldn't own it all the way, right? Uh, but were likely shaped by the fact that I have a son uh, with autism. So I went from just being identity driven or identity focused uh, language about positionality to relationship uh, addition as well. But I want to end with uh, this last statement, and this is one that is uh, by no means perfect, but a lot better than it was, and it is highlighting um, the multifaceted nature of positionality. So, uh, by the way, is, this gets even more challenging when you have multiple authors. So the paper this is written from has four authors, and we all were very different positions in terms of every one of the things that I'm going to say here. So this is written as a collective, which was really kind of challenging uh, to write, but um, you know that it now has three different kind of components that I think is, uh, is a step in the right direction. The first is, again, about the perspectives, so that uh, instead of uh, considering as a medical disorder, rather we take a, a, an inclusive, interdisciplinary, and developmental perspective, uh, and that we align very closely with advocates uh, more than um, uh, medical researchers. Talked about our identities, specifically that two of us had members on the spectrum uh, and that all, of, oh my God, there were eight of us. There were eight of us on this, um, that we all had experiences working directly with individuals with autism. But then this very last piece, I think is the part that I'm, I'm somewhat proud of. And it took me some work and Tamara, I think you were instrumental in kind of pushing me on this, um, is to identify a very specific way in which those positions affected the outcome of our work or the process of our work. And that it not only did it shape how we interpret our data, but it shaped it in a very specific way so that we really were more likely by our own positionality to search for opportunities for hope and for possibilities rather than for um, fear or concern or uh, worry. So um, that's what I've got for um, uh, positionality statements. And if there are others who have them and would like to share, I by all means would welcome the opportunity. Sorry to take so long, uh, but again, uh, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to, to me or any of the students. And thank you all for joining us really. Thank y'all for sharing. Um, I, I think there's so much that we can take from this. Uh, an example of how to incorporate positionality in our class, even decolonizing to a certain extent, um, our opening up our assignments and um, supporting students in their own positionality and how they make sense um, or move through uh, our program and making sense of the literature in our fields. So um, I'm grateful. Thank you for sharing these examples for us. And um, I'm excited about the possibilities and the hope that you've generated in this session. Um, we, in, in talking about more possibilities and generate. So y'all, let's give them a, a, a round of applause. Thank you so much, Sierra and Brittany and Owan and Brad. We appreciate your time. So our next, a couple of um, activities that we have coming up next on our agenda before you go. This Friday at 12 p.m., we will be going to Pakistan. So if you have not gone, get your passport out and come with us. You don't even have to worry about packing your suitcase or worrying about paying for a luggage fee 
or even actually having your passport. So join us, um, doctoral student, first year doc student, uh, IME doc student, Amber Noor Mustafa will lead us on a journey to Pakistan. So please join us if you have time on Friday at 12 o'clock. Two weeks from today on March the 17th, um, Eric Golden, oh Lord, not Golden, Eric Ludwig, sorry, Eric, I'm thinking of our student, Eric Golden. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Eric Ludwig and um, his team will lead us in a discussion on feedback and the importance of feedback and providing um, relevant feedback for our students. Eric, would you like to say anything about the upcoming session? Sure. And I think Brad's conversation on uh, this conversation on positionality um, will also play a role in how we talk about feedback. And, um, you know, as I think about this, um, thinking about feedback critically, not only how we provide it and what it is, but how feedback connects to larger systems um, of grading and assessment and how that shapes the experiences of students and of us um, as teachers and how we can think about ways um, with, with learning always in mind, right? That, that learning is the goal um, and thinking about uh, ways forward. So that's kind of what's on the plate. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm excited about this. I appreciate y'all um, coming and joining us in these in these discussions. And let's keep it keep the conversation going after this. Um, you can um, tweet about the session that you attended, or tweet any of the authors if you have if you would like. Please put your Twitter 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 handle Twitter handle um, or any of your other social media that you're on in the chat and. Um, let's keep this discussion going. Well, we'll see you Friday at 12 o'clock for our trip to Pakistan.